in our machinery and says, okay, the user wants the full cause. They don't just want the E, they want the full story of what happened. It pushes that up into the air channel and now you can deal with it. You can catch the full cause, basically. You can catch the full cause and you can look at it and you can see the entire story of what went wrong. And the cause is where you're gonna find the execution trace, it's where you're gonna find the parallel errors, the sequential errors, the finalizer errors. You're gonna see all of that information embedded in cause in a lossless fashion. Zio never loses any errors, and if you run into a situation where it does, it's a bug, <laughs> and it needs to be fixed, but that's the goal of Zio, is to never lose any errors in any type of composition. That way you always have the full story about what went wrong and why, and you can fix whatever problem it was. So once you sandbox a computation like this, which you would, I would only recommend you do this at very key points in your app. So don't aggressively sandbox, let things die. There's no reason to, to pretend you can recover from defects. You can't recover from defects. You can't recover from out of memory exceptions or like a whole host of other problems. You just can't. There's no sense pretending that you can. Instead, let it crash. And then limit the damage that it does at some high level where you have the knowledge that you can ignore a whole strand of computation. And where you sandbox in your app, first off, you may not even sandbox. If you're writing a command line utility that processes a file, don't sandbox, let it crash. It'll propagate as a process failure and that's fine. But if you're writing a um, server that has a large number of, it's servicing a large number of concurrent requests from different users, then you probably will want a sandbox because if you have a bug in your code, you don't necessarily want to take down the entire web server, you just want to kill the request associated with that. So you sandbox at the level of every request handler. And it's the same way for, for other things. Um, you're, there's, in most applications, there's an ideal point at which you should sandbox if you want to limit the damage done by catastrophic errors and defects. Oh, you can only see a pink shirt. Oh. I will restart this. Just in case it's my fault. <coughs> How about now? Great. <coughs> All right, so any questions about that? Make sense? So ordinarily, don't worry about sandboxing. Occasionally, when you really have to worry about it, worry about it at the right point in your application. It could be one point where it's natural to sandbox. Do you recommend ever using like a debugger, or is it harder better debugging approaches than sandboxing stuff? Well, you can use an ordinary debugger with Zio code. So you can put a breakpoint, for example, on a line out of full comprehension, um, and then you can use the execution traces, which help a lot, sort of figuring out what happened after the fact if you have a, a log and maybe can't reproduce the issue. And in theory, there's other types of machineries that you could build uh, for Zio that haven't been built yet. For example, you can pause fibers and resume them. So there's other, there's hooks that you could add if you wanted to debug in a slightly different fashion, but, but mostly have not been added. So I would recommend you know, use, use a debugger Use your favorite debugger. It's probably good enough to get the job done, especially with execution traces. So we've seen effect and effect total. There's another very handy function called effect async. And this is for when you're dealing with some side affecting asynchronous code. How do you know you're dealing with side affecting asynchronous code? What's the sign that you're dealing with some async code? Unit for sure, so if you see unit in the signature, then that means side affecting. And in particular, if you're passing callbacks to a function, that means you're dealing with async code. So async code is characterized by callbacks. And they're not always called callbacks. They can be called, sometimes they're like, you have the Java future APIs and callback listeners, callback handlers, there's lots of names for these things and lots of classes for them, tons of classes for them. But fundamentally what they are is, you call an async API and you give it at least one function. And that function is the success handler and it will be called at a later date 
when the computation or the data or whatever is done. An example would be JavaScript set timeout. You give it a function, and after a certain amount of time, it's going to call your function. That's an async API. And of course, Java has its own mechanism of, of doing scheduling. It's a scheduler, scheduled executor, and you can call this schedule method, and you give it a runnable, and you specify how long to wait, and you give it a time unit, and then after that amount of time has elapsed, then it's going to invoke your runnable. It'll call the run function on your runnable. So this, even though it may not look like it, this is a callback-based API. Callback-based APIs are characterized by other code calling into your code to resume a computation that couldn't complete right away. The alternative to async is sync. If you, if you say you want to read a megabyte file, then an alternative is to block the thread and have it just wait there until that file has been read, and then the thread resumes. But in modern applications, we try not to block threads because they interfere with scalability of the server. So we try never to write code like that and instead to use async APIs, like Netty is async, even Jetty has a async, I think, these days. Lots of these web APIs, they ha or um, web servers, they're, they're async because you can get more, you can squeeze more performance out of them that way. And <clears throat> as a result, you, uh, you often run into this pattern where instead of blocking the thread waiting for that thing to happen, you give it a function. And then it's not going to, when it returns, it, it doesn't signify anything. Um, it's irrelevant when it returns. It'll return right away, but it doesn't mean the computation is done. At some later point in the, in the, in the day, it's going to call your callback function. It's going to give you that result of the computation. And then you can do something with it. You can keep on chugging away after you've gotten that megabyte file. That's what async is all about. Async APIs are not very easy to use. They're very painful. You may have heard of the expression callback hell. Callback hell happens when you have deeply nested callbacks. I think I have an example here. No, I, I deleted it, it's too bad. Um, but yeah, callback hell happens when you, you call something and you feed it callbacks and then its success callback needs to call something else and then you need to feed it a callback and then you keep on doing that. And you end up with horribly nested code where it's hard to get information from the inside to the outside because of the way it's structured. It's hard to propagate information and impossible to propagate errors, basically. And an effect system like Zio means you can say goodbye to callback hell forever. You no longer have to deal with callback hell. And why that's possible is because asynchronous effects are built into Zio. They're built into Zio, so you can take async callback-based APIs and you can lift them up to Zio and not have to deal with them anymore. We're going to do that in this exercise. So we're going to take this Java Scheduled Executor API, which is not very pleasant to use, and we're going to wrap it up into a nice, neat, tidy Zio effect that succeeds with unit and cannot fail. And once you have this nice sleep function, you can use it in, let's say, a four comprehension like this, could do sleep, one time unit dot milliseconds or microseconds, whatever. And then sleep again and again and again and again and again, and maybe do some print lines. Now, this looks like a block of synchronous code. It's like we're going to do this, then we're going to do that, then we're going to print, then we're going to sleep three more times. We'll print and then we'll sleep. And this has a, a linear ordering. This has a linear order. And we can see what that linear order is, and it's nice to work with this. And by the way, these, these sleep functions could return something. In this case, sleep only returns the unit, but they could return something. It doesn't matter to us. So what we're able to do here is we're able to use Zio to unify across synchronous and asynchronous effects. Whether we're doing something with, um, in a synchronous style or an async style, we interact with it in the exact same way by using flab map and map. So Zio, Zio unifies different modes of computation. It brings them all under the same syntax. We don't use a different style of program. We don't have to care, for the most part, whether or not something is sync or async. We just interact with it in a logically linear fashion. This is logically linear, semantically linear. This happens before this. It looks like these things are blocking, but does it really matter whether it's callback based or whether it is blocking a thread, it doesn't matter to us, so we don't need to worry about that anymore. But of course, to use this for comprehension with this 
what we now know to be an async effect, we have to take this callback-based API and we have to import it into Zio. And to do that, we're going to use uio.effect uh, async. And then we have to give it two type parameters. The error type is going to be nothing, and the success type will be unit. And then we're going to wrap this big blob of code. And we're going to be given a callback as the first parameter here. We'll call that callback callback, I guess. And we have to invoke that callback whenever the computation is ready to resume. So we're going to call that callback when the computation is ready to resume. So in this case, as soon as we, we call this scheduled executor schedule, we feed it our runnable, and then Java at some point later is gonna call this runnable, it's gonna call the run method on this runnable. So here's the point where we need to resume the computation. So to resume the computation, we're going to call the callback, oops, oops. We're gonna call the callback and we're going to feed it a Zio effect, which will resume the computation. In this case, we have to feed it something that has type UIO of unit. So I'm just gonna do UIO succeed of unit. Um, but there's a name for this actually, it's so common, it's just called unit, so I'll just feed the callback with the unit value. So then what happens is Zio packages this up into this UIO unit computation. And when this effect is run, it will end up calling this scheduled executor, which will call the schedule method, which will create the runnable, and then at some point in the future, the runnable will be called by Java. And then when the runnable is called, we'll go ahead and call this Zio callback here with unit, with the unit value. And then the entire computation will continue with that unit value. It will resume. And so we end up being able to take that nasty callback based API and lifting it up into a Zio effect where we can program with it in a semantically linear fashion. You can use this over any callback-based API. There are lots of callback-based APIs. There's tons in Netty. There's tons in almost every modern Java library out there is, is going to be callback-based API. There's only one major standout, or holdout, I should say, and that's the JDBC. The JDBC is how you interact with databases in the JVM, and it's all blocking, unfortunately but that will eventually be replaced by an asynchronous version of the JDBC. So eventually, at, at some point, probably in the next five years, everything will be async. Everything will be a callback-based API, but you don't actually need to use callbacks. If you have something like CEO, you can hide that as an implementation detail. <clears throat> All right. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Good question. Um, what would the case where an exception is strong? Um, where I have to report back an error? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. So let's say we're dealing with in exercise ten with this read chunk callback function, and this is some Java API. We don't really have control over it. We have to interact with it, and this one is requiring we pass it two callbacks. Why two callbacks? Well, because in the event that it's actually able to read that chunk of data, it's gonna call the success callback. But if it can't read that chunk of data, it's gonna call the failure callback. So how can we import that into Zio? It's not too hard. All we have to do is call, in this case, task effect async. Our throwable will be our error type and array of byte will be our success type. And then we have this callback here that we have to call. And then inside here, we're going to call the Java read chunk. So we're calling the Java read chunk here. In the success case, we get back this array. So in here, we're going to call the callback with task succeed of array. And in the failure case, we get back this throwable So we'll call the callback with task.fail of the throwable. So we can call the callback with either the success or we can call it with the failure. And whether we call it with success or failure determines how this computation resumes. 
So we can fail this resulting task or we can make it succeed. Does that make sense? This is the Java API that we're wrapping. And our success callback just calls the callback with task succeed, thereby making this one succeed. And the failure callback just calls the callback with task fail, thereby making this task fail. Make sense? Okay. And actually, there will be some times when you call the callback and you won't actually know whether or not it's succeeding or failing. It just has more work to do before you can determine that, which is fine too. So some APIs, actually quite a number of them, they have a way that you can cancel a computation that's in progress, an async computation. So for example, when you use Java's scheduler to schedule something in the future, you get back something that you can use to cancel that if you decide to change your mind about, about whether or not that runs. And um, similarly, a lot of the async APIs for network IO, they have a way to cancel something that's in progress. And you can integrate with such code using effect async interrupt. This allows you to do the same thing as effect async, but you can specify a little computation that will be run to cancel the underlying IO or time-based scheduling operation or whatever it might be that can be canceled. So you just give it a little effect there that will be run as, as soon as it needs to cancel. And uh, you can work this on your own. I'm not going to look at it. It's not that common. But you should know that everything that's baked into Zio, all the functionality that's baked into Zio can be canceled. And when it is canceled, it doesn't leak resources. So for example, if you cancel, if you cancel a sleeping computation, then it won't, it'll actually be removed from the scheduler and it won't consume any more resources. If you cancel reading from a file, then that will stop reading the file. It won't actually wait on more. If you cancel socket connection, for example, it would terminate the socket connection and so forth. All right, the last thing we're gonna look at inside this section is how you actually run these effects. Remember these effects are pure values. So at the edge of your program, you have to run them and you can do that in several different ways. One of the easiest is just to, in your main app, extend default runtime. And once you extend default runtime, you can now do things like unsave run, say hello IO. And this will, this is not a function, this is a procedure. It's gonna go through and this is where all the magic happens. This is where all the runtime interpretation, the parallel computation, coalescing of errors and so forth, thread shifting, and, um, and everything else that's baked into Zio, resource handling, it happens here when you call unsafe run. As that description of a program is translated into the effects that it describes. So you can't, that's the only way that you can escape a Zio effect. Once you have a Zio effect, things go into Zio effects, but they never come out basically. And of course, you can make them come out by calling an unsafe run, but you should ideally you use that unsafe run function as little as possible. And that's not just so you can do FP, by the way, that's for practical reasons as well. The more you call unsafe run, every time you call unsafe run, you translate from the world of Zio where you get error collection and thread management and cooperative yielding and all this other great stuff, you know, execution traces, you get all that stuff for free in the world of Zio. When you call unsafe run and you leave an effect, you go from a Zio effect that can succeed with an A to an A, then that's a boundary for Zio. And then you're on your own after that. None of those features will apply to your own code that's already called unsafe run. So that's one practical reason for never leaving, leaving Zio. But the other practical reason is that unsafe run blocks a thread, and any time you have an operation that blocks a thread, then you may be looking at potential for deadlock. So anytime you're blocking a thread, if it's somehow through a very tangled, complicated scenario of some things pointing to other things waiting on that thread, then you can, you can easily run into a situation where you deadlock in a complex application. It's best just to build purely asynchronous applications that don't block, because that way you'll never run into those deadlock scenarios.
All right, so let's take a look at some basic operations we can do. We know how to describe the type of zero effects. We also know how we can construct some very basic effects like success and failure, or taking a hunk of Java code and Ruscala code and lifting it up into a zero effect. But how can we, given one zero effect, produce another zero effect? Or given two zero effects, for example, combine them together into a single zero effect? Well, there's a bunch of things we can use to do that. Let's look at map right now. So in the first exercise, take this UIO of string and map its, or UIO of int, and map its integer into a string by calling to string on it. Map operates over the success channel of the effect. So map operates on the A. For a Z O R E A, map maps over the A value and lets you turn it into some B value. In this case, I'm going to map over this and add one to it, and so forth. So you can see map is just does exactly what you think it would do based on the name. Now, Zio doesn't just have a success channel, it has an error channel. That's the E-type parameter. And you can map over errors. So you don't have to keep your errors constant. You can change them throughout different stacks or different layers of your application. And there are many reasons for changing. Sometimes you'll get an error from this system that you need to translate into a business error, some domain error. So you need to map error over that to change that. In this case, we'll turn this string or this integer error into a string error just by calling the underscore dot two string on it. All right, flat map is much more powerful than map. Flat map lets us do that sequential computation that I talked about in the first part of this workshop today. So what we're going to do in this exercise here is we're going to flat map over this integer. And if it is even, we're going to do the attack effect. Uh, but if it's odd, we'll do the retreat effect. So how we do this is we call flat map. And then we, we have the integer here. And we look at the integer. And if the integer is even, then we'll do attack, else we'll do retreat. So you can see here the essence of context-sensitive sequential computation because we've got this effect and then this function that we pass to flat map gets to look at the result of that effect. It gets to look at the result of executing this effect. And then based on that result, it can either do this thing here, attack, or it can do this thing here, retreat. So this function here passed to flat map it actually returns different effects based on the runtime value of this integer that's produced by here. Of course, we know this is 42 because we can see it, but in a real program, this is just going to be a, an effect that returns an integer, and so we're not going to know what that is. And it's going to be which of these two paths we take is going to depend on this runtime value. That's, in a nutshell, the power of flat map is that not only does it let you do one thing first and then another thing, but that second thing that you do can depend on the runtime value produced by the first thing. And you can see that structure represented in four comprehensions because in subsequent lines of the four comprehension, you can reference the values of the preceding four comprehension statements. Uh, yes, this should be, why is this? Yeah, it should be that. My question. I think the next can you I guess because like UIO is a type of alias, I can do can I do something like UIO the string forty two dot flat map UIO in dot uh, or uh, string dot two in something that can throw an error. Um if you want to throw an error, well first off that's definitely gonna change the type of this. But if, if you want to actually throw using the throw keyword, then you should use uh, stick it inside effect. So like task.effect, for example. And you can throw inside there, and it will be translated into zeo fail. 
if you just want to fail, if you want to generate a failure, for example, then I can do something like this. If it's even, then I want to do IO fail. Uh-oh, else retreat. Now, of course, oops, what did I do? This, of course, will change the type here. This will no longer be UIO. This is going to be um, IO, yeah, a string unit. So it's going to change the error type. If you fail inside inner expression, it's going to change the error type of your whole effect. Those error types will propagate upwards. But this is one of the nice things about Zio, actually, thanks to work we am did, we am and I, uh, some time ago, is we really worked hard on making Zio type infer. And how that works is, as you're combining different effects using, for example, flat map and other operations, then Zio is always inferring the most precise type that it can. It's auto-inferring the most precise type that it can. So in this case, we have lots of computations that can't fail, like this one here and this one here. But we have one in the center of this that can fail with the string. So the unification of all these effect types, the unification of those error types, ends up being the string. Because the other ones are nothing. This one is a string. So basically, um, you know, nothing is a less, it's, it's a more specific way to fail than the, the string. So the unification of that ends up being the string. Error type is the failure. So ordinarily, <coughs> You should not have to specify any types in Zio. It should be able to infer everything and do that as precisely as possible. <coughs> and, and if it doesn't, then it's, it's a bug of some type that, that needs to be fixed, a uh, type inference bug. What's that? You know, I don't know why Boolean was there. Um, I, I think that this exercise probably went through some iteration. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that as well. Um, you could do Boolean here. And then you could, um, like maybe you're going to return true or false based on whether you attack or retreat. Maybe you'll return true if it attacks. So you could do that with the const one which const just maps something to a constant. So it's going to map these effects to the constant return value. So that's an easy way to do that. And then that way, when you end up using it down here, it'll have the right types. Yeah? Maybe the other chat. Yes. Does Zio have something similar to <coughs> that one when the input isn't needed? Const, yeah. Uh, favorite Scala linter that can statically check whether or not the code being run is obviously doing nasty non-pure things, which would be a problem for working within pure code. So there's a um, Scala fix file you can use inside the Scala Z slash Scala Z project. And that Scala fix file can be used with Zio to help flag parts of your code that are just running side effects outside of effect or effect total. So that might be useful. And l even longer term, although not too longer term, there's going to be a project to help you do that very reliably. So a project you can just add to your build and it's going to tell you what to do and what not to do so you can help make sure you're keeping people on the happy path. Yeah, there's wart remover, but it, it's wart remover is good. It's basically being superseded over time by ScalaFix. So if you're looking for a, a configurable Scala linting tool that you can use, then I'd say ScalaFix is probably what you want to use at this point. It has more, more momentum, I think, and it's faster. And um, it should work even post Scala 2, so in, into Scala 3. All right, so let's do exercise four. Let's sum two integers produced by two effects, just to see how you can use map and flat map. Well, you can do it the easy way, which is just a four comprehension. And a four comprehension can be seen as a way to pull numbers outside of effects, or pull values, pull success values outside effects. So I can pull out the int one, I'll just call it i1 out of int one effect, pull out the i2 out of the int two effect, 
and then yield the sum of I1 and I2 down here. That's probably the easiest way to do that. But of course you can do it just using flat map and map yourself if you don't like four comprehension syntax or you want to understand what's actually going on behind the scenes here. This, this is clear. Like, well, this, after you understand it, you can have that. Uh, you know, some people say that some people prefer to stick with map and flat map forever. Others prefer the four comprehension. No, I don't think there's. I would say most people end up going with the four comprehension in cases like this. Let me show you the other one just so you can see it. Int one flat map i one. Int two map i two. And map that to i one plus i two. So which of these you find easier is, is a matter of taste. I think that I think that if you're going to use lots of operators aside from flat map and map, and it's easier to do it in this style because then you can mix and match them. If you're going to stick primarily to a bunch of flat maps and maps, poor comprehension makes sense. All right, let's in exercise five, let's write a little program combinator. This program combinator is going to take and it's going to repeat this action n times. So here's how you would do this. If n is a less than or equal to 1, then just return the action. That's that effect. On the other hand, if n is not less than or equal to 1, then what you want to do is run the action. And then after you run that action, you want to call repeat n2 again with n minus 1, but the same action. And what does this thing do here? What does the zip write operator do? Well, it zips these two things together, so it will have the effects of both sides. But then it will map over it and give you the return value of the right-hand side. Does that make sense? So this here is a program combinator because it's operating on a program as if it were a value. It allows you to take a whole program and repeat it some number of times, which is something that you can't do with future. You can't write a function that takes the future and returns another future that repeats the first future a certain number of times. Why can't you do that? Does anyone know why you can't do that? Yeah, future is not lazy, it's already running. So there's no concept of repetition. Future is not a functional thing. And that's why you can't write future combinators. You can't write them. It doesn't make sense. But you can write combinators on ZOFX because they're just ordinary values. And so this one takes one value and gives you back another value that represents the repetition of this value the specified number of times. It's way easier to work with functional effects than futures, just because you can write these very powerful meaty combinators that can, given some effects, can give you back other effects with different modifications applied. Uh, a note on tail recursion. So it's still useful to, does anyone not know what tail recursion is? All right, so let me just cover that briefly. But basically, a function is, this, this function here is not tail recursive. It's not tail recursive because the return value of uh, this branch here is not a simple call to this function. So this does recurse, it recurses, but this recursion is referred to as not in tail recursive form. It's not in tail recursive form because after we call ourselves, we call this factorial function again, we take the result of that and we multiply it by n. So this is not tail recursive. If we were to delete this n times, then suddenly we would have something that's tail recursive. Tail recursive functions have the following property. If you write a tail recursive function in Scala, Scala compiler can compile that into a while loop that will operate in constant stack space. 
So I'll, I'll show you. There's a very easy technique you can use to do that. Oops. You just take basically this thing here and you stick it into a parameter and you call it accumulator. And then instead of returning turning, um, this thing here, we're just going to return, we'll start the accumulator off at one. And then we'll return the accumulator in this case. And then in this case, <coughs> instead of doing the multiplication here, we're going to do it on the accumulator. We're going to do n times the accumulator. And so now I've, I've written this in tail recursive form by feeding in this state into the function. And here I return it. It starts out as one, but here I return it. And then inside here, I do the mul multiplication before I invoke this function. So if you know the way Scala evaluation works, this will be evaluated and this will be evaluated before this function is ever called. So the evaluation of these arguments happens before it's called. So calling this function recursively is the very last thing that happens in any branch. And so it's tail recursive. So Scala compiler can translate this into a very efficient while loop that's going to operate in constant stack space. In fact, you can, you can prove that if you want by adding the Scala util annotation, or maybe it's Scala annotation tail rec. You add this, and then if Scala can't do the translation, it will complain. It'll say, uh-oh, I couldn't do it. This is how you guarantee that some function of yours is, is capable of operating in constant stack space. You write it in tail recursive form, and you add the annotation. I, I don't know. I certainly know that Scala won't guarantee it will translate it into a while loop without the tail rack. But if you add the tail rack, <coughs> yeah, right. The annotation makes the compiler fail if it's not, if it can't actually, if it doesn't believe that that's tail recursive if it can't be convinced. And actually, there's some cases where it is tail recursive, but you can't convince the Scala compiler it is. All right, so why do you have to worry about tail recursion in functional programs? You don't want the stack to overflow. Yeah, because we, we only have finite stack space. We don't want it to overflow. So sometimes we have to write things in a tail recursive fashion. Now, a, a ZOFX system is never going to run out of stack space. So ZO programs will not stack overflow. But they can, if you don't write them in tail recursive form, they can still consume heap. They can consume more and more heap. If you have a recursive function whose return type is a ZO effect, then even though it's never going to stack overflow, it may, however, consume unbounded heap as it keep on, keeps on going deeper and deeper and deeper into the recursion. So if you want to make sure that your programs, first off, if you know the recursion will terminate at some point, then you don't need to make it tail recursive because it will consume some heap and then it will go back down to zero after it stops. And you have way more heap than you have stack. There's only a little tiny bit of stack for every thread. Basically, almost nothing. Whereas heap is huge. So in many cases, you actually don't need to make your ZO programs tail recursive. And they'll just consume heap until they're done, and then it will all go back down to zero. That's fine. The one exception is if you have an infinite loop. If you have something that loops forever, then you need to make that tail recursive. If you do not make it tail recursive, then eventually you will consume all the heap. And there's no way around that. It's just law of physics. If you don't write tail recursive code, then it's either consuming stack or heap. Ordinarily, in <coughs> this type of code, it consumes stack. But when in ZO code, it's going to consume heap. Oh, uh, what? Uh, yeah, or just, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, you could use effect total to, to implement this one, right? Yeah, you could do that. So if 
Uh, What's that? Yeah, so the, let me show you the sort of idiomatic way to, to do this one, which would be something like... So this one here is the same factorial function, but it's written using zero effect. <coughs> this one here will stack overflow <coughs> eventually. If you give it a big enough n, it will stack overflow. This one will never stack overflow. However, if you give it a big enough n, you might run out of heap. Maybe. Probably not. This one here, if you give it a big enough n, you're, you will suck up a CPU that consumes 100%. And there's nothing you can do with that computation. Whereas this one here, written using Zio, you could actually fork this into a separate fiber and you could decide to terminate that computation at some point. Or you could even time it out. You could say, we're going to give you 60 seconds to execute this and if you can't do it, we're going to terminate it. So these are just some of the nice properties that come from you, you not only not, not, not a not only do you not have to worry about the stack overflow, because now you've switched from consuming stack, which is finite, to heap, which is huge, so you don't have to worry about it as much. But also you can time out this computation, you can terminate it, you can do other things. And also, even on a single threaded system, you could fire up a whole bunch of these and run them concurrently, and Zio would manage the time, basically giving each one time sharing chance to advance their progress. So you could execute 100 of these concurrently in JavaScript. If you're doing Scala.js, for example, if you're using Zio with Scala.js. So factorial I.O. is, is Taylor-cursive? <clears throat> no. But you have a big, <laughs> you have way more heap, so it's less likely to matter. Now, on the tail recursive version of this is not that hard, so I'll leave that as an exercise for the reader. Yeah? Was that what's called trampoline? Zio uses a trampoline internally. I mean, the, the, the example you showed where you, you made the object and mapped it, is that kind of doing it at the high level, or is that you depending on Zio? It's me depending on Zio and then Zio trampolining internally. Trampolining is a generic technique that can be used to basically translate a, a program from consuming stack into one that consumes um, heap by storing continuations on the heap. And that's what Zio does, basically. That's why you never stack overflow with Zio. It's the only way to make a functional effects system in Scala work. All right, so we're going to skip over some of these. If, if you want to spend time basically figuring out how to translate between for comprehensions and map, flat map and map, and that's probably a good exercise because it helps to be able to truly understand at a deep level how every for comprehension ends up being translated into a flat map, flat map, flat map, followed by a final map. And then here's the one that I want you all to do if you can. I want you to rewrite this exercise 14, rewrite play game one, which is a procedural function, rewrite it into a pure function that uses Zio. And at this point, you should have everything you need to do that. You should know everything you need to know in order to do that. So go ahead and do that and paste your solution in Gitter when you're done. So if you're on this chat room for functional Scala, Then just enter in the three backtick characters followed by the word Scala and hit shift enter. And then you can paste a whole bunch of code in here and then command enter and it will be syntax highlighted for you. <coughs> so how to do this? Well.
I would start by copy pasting the code, the imperative code. Copy paste that code. And then just start liberally adding task effect to anything you see which is not a function. And turn, turn assignment into the backward arrow and make that code block of work comprehension. You know this is going to return unit, so just yield a unit there at the bottom of your for comprehension. This print line will be translated into task effect. And then we're going to ignore the unit we get out of that. And then we've got all this stuff. This, this stuff's not so easy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do I'll stick all of this inside a, a task. And then here I'm going to match over the answer. And I'll do different things in the different cases. The question is, where does this go? This is a conditional. And it's very clear what's happening in this procedural program here. This is just happening at the end here. It's matching over this effect result. And then it's doing a bunch of stuff here. How do we incorporate this big case block into this for comprehension? That's the tricky part of this exercise. And the answer is, well, we, we know we need to do effects in every branch, so we know this, this whole thing, this whole match expression needs to yield an effect. That should be the return type of this. This needs to yield an effect. That means we need to yield an effect from every branch inside this case, and that the success value of those needs to be the same. We have to return the same thing from every branch. So what that means is we're going to end up sticking this to the to the right of one of these backward arrows. So we're going to perform it all over here and then this is going to generate that final you know, map over this effect. Now these print lines have to be turned into task effect. Obviously they're not pure so we have to wrap them in task effect. And then this play game one was a recursive reference to the original game, but we've got to change that to play game two. Okay, so now we're returning a task unit from every single branch of our case. So the effective type of everything you see here highlighted is task of unit. And we don't need to do anything with that unit, so we ignore it. But there's a problem in this part of the code. There's a major problem. Does anyone see what that problem is? <coughs> yeah, the problem is here we compute a value and we're not doing anything with that value. Remember, this doesn't actually do anything. It just builds a value. It's a description. And here we return this value. So this program here is identical to this program. They do the same thing. If in any functional program you see someone building an expression that's not used, you can delete it because it has no effect. It's the same here. We're building the value here that we're not using, so we may as well delete it. Well, that's obviously not what we want. What we want to do is zip these two things together and throw away the, the left-hand <coughs> side, for example. So we'll just do that. So we zip them together, we use the zip right. And now we have the functional version of that procedural code. And we, we just wrapped all this stuff. Obviously in a real program we wouldn't use these wrappers, we would just use already wrapped functions. Like Zio has all this stuff built in, there's no reason to, to wrap it. But this just shows you how to do it in the simplest possible way by more or less blindly copy pasting task effect over anything that's an effect. So this is the tricky part of that. This is the tricky part. Conditionals, knowing where to put conditionals, you always put them to the right 
of the backward arrow and the for comprehension. And that will make more sense if you expand this for comprehension out to a bunch of flat maps and maps. It will make sense why that has to happen. <coughs> All right, did anyone else get that? So now we have to take a look at failure. We've seen how to use the ZO types, type aliases. We've seen how to build basic effects. We've seen how to compose different effects together so that we can make up our programs. Um, now we need to figure out what are we going to do when things go wrong? How can we deal with failure? So we'll look at that in, in this section. So. <coughs> first exercise, you're just supposed to create a simple failure. And you do that using fail, which we've seen before. In the next exercise, you're supposed to translate this exception throwing program into its ZO equivalent, which is, is very straightforward. You just basically turn the throw into a fail. and the other one into a succeed. And there you have it. Now, to recover from a failure, there's several different methods you can use. The first one we'll look at is a method called fold. And the name of fold comes from the fold that is attached to either an option. So if you have an either or an option, you can call a fold method on there. And the fold method basically forces you to handle the two cases. It's the same way for a fold on a ZO effect. This one here, when I call divide 100 by 0, it might fail because of an arithmetic exception. And I can see that in the type. I don't want this one to fail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call fold here. And I'll just use a dummy value in the case that it's 0. And in the case that it's not 0, I'll just pass along that same value. So I'm going to divide 100 by 0. And uh, if there was a problem, I'll return minus 1. Otherwise, I'll just return that same number. So fold lets you handle both the error case and the success case at the same time. And you have to return values here, not effects. And you get those values out of this. So look here at the type of this expression. What is the type of this expression? Oh, uh, it says option, so I guess it wants to uh, it wants me to do this, which is fine. I'll just do this. So what's the type of this? It's UIO of option int. Can UIO fail? It can't. So the failure is gone. How did the failure go away? I handled it. And that's a very interesting thing in, in all ZO code. When you handle your errors, it changes the static type. And you know by looking at it, your compiler knows that you've already handled the errors in that part of the code. That's very powerful. It can help you see where you've yet to handle errors. And if you're doing critical things in your code and you don't want it to fail, you can just look at the types and make sure that you've dealt with all the errors in that part of the code. All right, so sometimes it's enough to, to use fold, but other times when you're recovering from, when you're specifying a handler for errors and a handler for success, you'll want to do another effect. And to do that, you can use fold M. So fold M lets you handle the error case and the success case in an effectful way. So in this case, I'm going to do the uh, same problem. I'll fold M here. But this, this time, I'm going to say print error. In, in the case of the error case, I'm going to say, I'm going to print an error saying cannot divide by 0. 
And then in the, in the success case, I'm going to call print division, which is going to print out the division. So here's my error handler. It's going to print out the error. And here's my success handler. It's going to be given that, that int here. And it's going to say the division is whatever. So I, I've done both error and success. And note that neither one of these print functions can fail. So that means that my recovery, my recovered effect cannot fail. But if one of these could fail for some reason, then the recovered effect could also fail for that reason. So it would be helpful if we had a combinator to do that. But um, right now you, you could give you could do type description. You could try to ascribe that type as having UIO, you know, use colon operator and then use UIO of something. And if it wasn't UIO, you get an error. But it would be good to add a combinator for that that would only basically a UIO combinator or maybe an error less unexceptional combinator that would only take a UIO and would simply return it back out that would just be used for saying, hey, I don't want any errors in this part of the code. All right, so there's, sometimes you, you also want to take that error channel and stick it inside the success channel as a value. You can do that in two primary ways, one by calling either on an effect and one by calling option. So if I take this thing here and turn either and call either, then now I have an effect that succeeds with an either. And that either contains either the left of the error or the right of the success. So this allows me to take my effect, which could fail, and turn it into one that can't fail by taking that error case and stuffing it into the, an either, error and success, and stuffing them into an either. And then once I have an either, I can, of course, you know, flat map over it or map over it. Here's my error case. I can do whatever I want with it because it's just an ordinary either. And if you don't really care about the error type, if you only care about whether or not it happened, did it happen, did it not, then instead of calling either, you can call dot option. And dot option will let you deal with those two possibilities, the none case and the sum case. Right, uh, so I need to repeat audience questions because for remote attendees, they can't actually hear what you're saying. So I, I just need to be more mindful about repeating that. All right, so finally, actually not finally, it looks like we'll cover a few more, but one of the operators I, I absolutely love, it's tremendously useful. And it, sometimes it's more useful than foldam and all these other ones that we've seen to date is just or else. Or else lets you specify a fallback. It has the same function as the or else method on option. And using it is really simple and elegant. You just do the first choice or else the second choice, and then you're done. There are many times, many bits of code where or else is the simplest, most compact way to solve a problem. And it's really, really surprising that that's the case, but it is. <coughs> what happens here? Well, first it's going to try this, and if it fails, it's going to go on to try this. Now look here carefully. Can first, first choice fail? Can that effect fail? Yeah. Can second choice fail? No. Can combine fail? No. So what, what happened here? The Scala compiler knows that our combined effect can fail. It knows that. How does it know that? Right. 
right? The or else combinator will always give you the error type of the right effect. And that's because if the first one failed, then the composed effect can only fail if the second one fails, and it will fail for that reason. So hence, in a big long chain of or else's, you're always going to end up with the rightmost error. So in general, the rightmost thing that you're or elseing together should be the one that doesn't fail, if you truly want to have a fallback plan for, for all possible fallbacks. Yeah, the, in this first choice or else second choice, because first choice is going to fail, well, we know that because there's a zero here. It's going to end up returning minus one. Okay, and if second choice it's, uh, can fail, but with different exceptions. Yeah, so if we have here an IO and we've got a string here, then what we're going to get back here is an IO with a string here when we or else these together. Yeah, of the rightmost thing, the error type of the rightmost thing. So catch-all can be used to catch all errors in a computation and to do some recovery. Use it like this, catch-all, here's your error, I'm going to ignore it, and I'll just return succeed UIO succeed of one. And like or else, or, or rather like some of the other ones, catch error eliminates the error type. So when you catch all, you're handling all errors. However, if the effect you return in here can fail, then your new composed effect can fail for the same reason. So if your exception handler can fail, then even though you caught all the exceptions, well, your exception handler might have failed. So your new composed effect can fail for that reason. Yeah? If I give catch all a partial function, will, it, will the compiler complain if I don't match all the exception types? So the question is, if we give catch all a partial function, will the compiler complain if we don't match all the exception types? And the answer is, unfortunately, I don't think that it will. <laughs> I, I don't think that it will. Let's see here. Um, case. Uh, well, this is this is nice. I, I at least get the error that I'm I am matching against something that cannot ever be matched against. Um, I, I don't know how to test that in this with this particular case, but that would be worth testing. Unfortunately. Because partial function is a subtype of function, it means you can pass a function anywhere a, you can pass a partial function anywhere where a function is, is accepted. So unless there's some magic in Scala that can warn against that scenario, which I suspect there's not, then unfortunately you're not going to do that. Now, um, catch sum, however, you call catch sum. And it expects a partial function. And so you can specify just the error type that you want to handle. And then you can handle that specific error type. What do I need? Oh, I need a. So that's what catch sum does, is it allows you to pick out some exceptions. Now catch sum doesn't change the error type because there's some errors you didn't handle. So it doesn't change the error type. And that should, that should be expected. All right. So here's a, a brief example, if you want to go through this, of what happens when you say you import this using effect total. Is this code total? No, it's not. 
And if you import it using an effect total, well, you've made a mistake. That's a bug in your code. That doesn't mean that the error is lost. Zeo never loses errors. It just means it will kill the fiber unless you choose to sandbox that error at some point in your application. So if you wrap this up in effect total, you'll find out by default it, it kills the fiber. You can sandbox it here and you can do something if you want. The sandboxing just takes that air type and balloons it into a cause, which gives you the full story. And then from there, you can call catch all or any of these other ones and do whatever you want with that full cause. Okay, let's go on to impure to pure. So see if you can take this exercise one and rewrite this. Oh no, let's not do this one. Let's do, let's do exercise two. So see if you can entirely on your own rewrite this to be a functional program using everything you've learned to date, especially the tricky thing about the match expressions and what you have to do when you're trying to incorporate a match expression or, or an if-then-else into a for comprehension. Let's see if you can do that and paste the solution in Gitter. Anyone have this one? The two tricky parts of this one are, well, just making sure you put this in the right place in the for comprehension, returning the same type of effect from every branch. And then also remember here, you're, this procedural code is doing two things. And when you turn this into a description, you can no longer do two things, rather you have to return one value. So if you just do this in a naive translation, then you'll end up producing a value that's subsequently ignored so you need to either flat map that or use the zip write operator 
to do both that thing and that thing and return the thing on the right. Yeah, this one looks great. Did everyone get that? Not yet? <coughs> so if you want to cheat, then you can look at, we've got Eris did one, Andrew did one, uh, which is also correct, and uh, Devin did one, looks correct. And this one, this one gets the job done. I like this way of structuring it. I like, I like this pulling out the effects and just making the string here. I like this one. Just you know, make the string based on the conditional, and that cleans up some stuff. And I like, I like this one just pulling the age out and saying, okay, this single line is trying to get the age, and if it can't get the age, it's going to call itself recursively <coughs> until it gets the age, and then eventually it's going to get the age. The only problem is. Uh, once it gets the age, well, then, then what? Um, it's going to keep on doing all this stuff. So you're going to get a buildup. If they answer a bunch of things, you're going to get a buildup of responses here. So you'd have to fix that problem. But I like the basic idea. Is task effect totally equivalent to io.succeed? The answer is no, because succeed is strict in its argument. So that means it's evaluated by Scala before it's ever passed the function. So succeed cannot be used to capture effects. It can only be used, you have a value, you already have a value, you stick it to <coughs> succeed and it turns it into the effect. If you want to capture effects, you have to use effect total. The result of task effect total will be a UIL? It'll be a task. So, right. Uh, well, task.effect total. Actually, I think that will be a UI. Yeah, this, this one looks good as well.
Okay, good. Lots of lots of good solutions here. And everyone's getting this part here. And everyone's getting yeah, everyone's getting that part. And then this one this just needs to be nested in a uh, in a for comprehension, otherwise you're computing a value that's thrown away. So it needs to be pushed over to the right side of one of these backward arrows, like uh, like the other ones. Oh, and I like this one. It just sort of cleans it up into a simple for comprehension here, and then no for comprehensions in this part of it. It's, it's quite nice. And lots of good solutions here. <clears throat> yeah, this one too. Great. All right, so let's take a look briefly at interop. So what other types do you know about in Scala that can handle failure as well as asynchronicity? Try. Well, try can handle failure, but only in synchronous computation. But try is a good one. Future, so future can handle failure as well as asynchronous computation. And it would make sense that since Zio can handle that as well, that you would be able to take a future and you would be able to lift it into a Zio effect. And in fact, that's correct. So let me show you how you do that. What you do is there's several different ways. One is the interop goes both ways, by the way. So if you, if you have a fiber, um, we'll, we'll talk about fibers more in a second here, but a fiber is an effect that, has, that is running right now. So when an effect has been kicked off, for example, you fork a fiber, you get, or you fork an effect, you get back a fiber, and that fiber represents an effect that's running. And this is actually the equivalent of that async package. When you have an async of A, that's equivalent to a, a fiber of A, basically. So you have this, this uh, fiber of A, and uh, you can take this fiber and directly convert it to a future. Why? Because just like a fiber is a running effect, well, a future is a running computation as well. So there's, there's an analog there. Futures and fibers are similar things. A future is not really a Zio effect because a future is already running. But a future really is a fiber. Both futures and fibers are really running. So when you build like combinators and stuff, you build them over effects. You don't build them over fibers. You build them over the programs. But still, there's lots of interesting things you can do with fibers. We'll talk about some of them later. Um, and also, you can, you can go from a future into a fiber. You just, like if you have this future here, you just call, uh, you call fiber.fromfuture and you give it the future. So fiber dot from future future one, and what that does is it just converts the uh, future directly into a fiber. So nothing fancy going on there. Now you can also convert effects into futures and futures into effects, and you do that using. The to future method of effect. So here I have task one dot to future, and um, if you compile this, you're going to get a compile error. And the reason why you get a compile error is because I have said I want something of type future int because I had a task of int and I, I wanted to convert it to a future int. So I called to future on this task, hoping to get back a future int, and I didn't. I didn't get back a future int. What did I get back? I got back a UIO of future int. Why? Why is that the case? Because you don't want to stop. Yeah, that's right. So all the methods in Zio are pure. They don't do, they don't actually perform any side effects, including to future. So instead of giving us back a future, which would involve kicking off a computation, an interpretation of that Zio effect, 
we get back a UIO, a future, which means in those cases where we actually do need, we're interacting with an external system that expects a future, for example, we need to call unsafe run on the thing we get out. And so in this case, I think we can do that. Yes, this extends default runtime, so we just call unsafe run here. And now it compiles because we've gotten the future out of the UIO by calling unsafe run on UIO. Yeah? Can you repeat that one more time? The difference between fiber and the uh, future type? Yeah, so a fiber is an effect that is currently running or w was running at some point, maybe it finished. So a fiber is, is that effect that's been started and, and it's running. And the fiber is like a handle on the running effect. It's a handle that allows you to control it. It's like a thread ID, or if you're familiar with Java threads, it's like a thread. You, you have a handle on a thread and you can, like, you can stop the thread and you can wait till it's done and you can do other things. But that thread represents, you have a thread out there and it's running some computation and the thread is the way that you control that running computation. And it's the same way, a, a fiber is a handle on a computation that's running. And fibers can be thought of as lightweight green threads, if you will. Many, many, many fibers can execute on the same physical thread, both, both in Scala.js, if you're using Zio on Scala.js, as well as, as, well as on the back end. Um, one thread can service 10,000 fibers easily. Future, um, future really is, it, it is a handle on a running computation, but um, futures operate in a totally different manner. They, they basically, every single operation on a future submits a new bit of work to a thread pool. And so what you end up having doing is, it, it's not an interpreter in the normal way of thinking about things. There is no reified stack associated with a future. It's not really a fiber. But it gives you some fiber-like properties. Like, for example, you can run a whole bunch of futures on a fixed number of threads. And that's because all the time they're constantly submitting their next operations to the thread pool. It turns out when you do it that way, it's extraordinarily slow. Futures are super slow. They could be a thousand times slower than Zio in some cases. It's not a very efficient way to write code to do it that way. And um, they, they do that to achieve uh, fairness. But Zio achieves fairness by basically uh, time sharing. So Zio has a more sophisticated algorithm that's going to run a bunch of things for one fiber on a thread before it decides to yield other fibers. And that allows you to warm up the CPU's cache. In modern CPUs, basically it takes a long time to get stuff from memory into the CPU. So they spend a lot of time just pulling stuff and waiting for stuff to be retrieved so the CPU can work on it. And as a result, you always want to do a bunch of computation, let that cache warm up, um, and operate efficiently for a while before you give up and, and share, do context switch with something else. And that's, what, that's the Zio strategy. That's why it's so much faster than future because it lets those caches warm up. It lets a lot of progress be made for one fiber before it switches over. But to do that, you need a totally different architecture than future. Future can't support that design. Another question about the timeline. Is this, uh, is the same way as future so when the computation is finished? Um, for this specific example here? Right, so the, the question is, if you have a fiber and other people try to get the result of the fiber, are they going to end up recomputing the result multiple times? Like if you have 20 different fibers trying to get the result of another fiber, are they gonna recompute that result 20 times or get the same result? And the answer is they'll get the same result, just like a future. So there really is very close correspondence to a future and a fiber. Another question. Twitter features. Yeah, there is interop, there's an interop package. So there's some people who are using stuff in the Twitter ecosystem, but also would prefer to use Zio. So they wrote some interop stuff for Twitter futures. So if you call like from future, it'll take Twitter futures. Uh, not this one, but if you add that module, it's another different library, then they, they use, they add it onto the Zio object, I think. So you can call like from Twitter future and 
unsafe run to Twitter future and those types of things. And there's also interop for Monix if you're using Monix. And there's interop for Cats.io as well. So no matter what you're using out there, oh, there's interop for all the Java futures. Java has completable future and future and so forth. You can convert all those things to and from, well, at least to Zio. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so the, the question is, um, what about cats libraries? And so the answer is twofold. First off, there are libraries out there that work, um, basically any library out there that's written for cats effect can work with Zio. And the reason for that is cats effect defines a series of type classes, an interface, if you will. And any effect type that implements those interfaces can be used with any of those cats effect libraries. So that means if you're using FS2 or HTTP 4S or Doobie or whatever, you can easily use those libraries with Zio. A lot of people do, in fact. So you can use Zio with all the libraries out there, more or less unmodified. Basically, most of your code won't change. You can just simply swap in Zio for whatever effect type you're using. Now, uh, the cat's effect library has more than just the type classes in it. It also has a reference implementation called cats.io. And some people use cats.io. Cats.io is an alternative to Zio. So you might be using cats.io instead of Zio today. Or you might be using another alternative like Monix task, for example. All of these are alternatives to Zio. And I, I wrote a blog post. If you're wondering which you should choose, cats.io or Zio, to work with cats effect libraries, I wrote a blog post on that a bit ago at degoes.net, basically enumerating some of the ways in in which Cats.io and Zio differ, and what basically Zio brings to the table that Cats.io does not. And I think a, a lot of people are finding that, that Zio provides stronger, for example, Cats.io doesn't actually guarantee that any finalizers will be run. Also, Cats.io doesn't have the ability to take a computation and shift it onto a different pool and have it stay there. It'll keep pop, pop backing to the one it's not supposed to be running on. So there are, and, Cats.io loses errors. An example would be if this part of code throws an error and then the finalizer throws an error, then Cats.io will lose one of those errors. So there are lots of little technical reasons why I think um, there's a lot of people are choosing Zio to power Cats Effect libraries rather than, than the Cats.io type, which was originally you know, intended as a reference implementation, not like a, you know, a heavy duty industrial grade implementation. A uh, question? Yeah, the speed advantage you talked about. Yeah. Would that speed come at a cost of latency? So the question was the speed advantage I talked about, would that come at the cost of latency? So the answer is not really in, in practice. So future achieves what could be regarded as optimal fairness in the sense that if you have a bunch of futures running on a fixed thread pool, they'll all get about even shares of that thread pool. Um, and w the, the Zio strategy is to give everyone more time to execute. So you can warm up the CPU cache and take advantage of uh, modern CPU architecture. And that results in very fast code compared to future. But it does result in giving them more time before you switch around. And, but you can configure that. So it's very configurable in Zio. If you, if you want to turn that knob more towards sort of fairness, giving everyone a smaller slice before you deal it off to someone else, um, because you can't accept the risk that someone's gonna do too much work before <coughs> sharing, then you can turn those knobs in Zio. So really Zio lets you achieve the future model if you want. I would never recommend that. There's no practical reason to do that. I, I, don't, I, th I don't think there's any applications out there that actually need that. And, and even there's, there's some work in future to help change that. It's difficult, can't break backward compatibility too much, but there's some work to change it. Basically, future was the very first generation of this in Scala, or maybe like second generation, but we've seen many, many generations since the original future, and it's widely acknowledged now that the future design is just suboptimal in almost every possible way. Another question. Yeah. Would you like to fill in what you meant by that? 
Yeah, question is, I was talking about finalizers. What do I mean by that? So I'm about to dive into that section, actually. So we'll talk about finalizers. But generically, you can think of a finalizer as whatever you stick in the finally block, try finally block. And Zio has a try finally block of its own that has the same guarantees as ordinary try finally, but you know, with the synchronous effects and concurrent effects and so forth. Another question. So if you use fibers with create them from futures, do you lose out on the speed benefits than just using fibers without futures? If the question is if you create fibers from futures, do you lose out on the speed benefits? The answer is yes. So when you create a fiber from a future, it's just a thin wrapper around that future. And all the work happens in the future where it's going to be slow. Um, however, if you take a Zio effect and convert it to a future, it's still fast. So when other code is calling into your code and it expects a future, then you can use Zio to sort of power that. And then there's the thin future layer at the front that's not actually doing the work. It's just receiving the result and propagating it along into the code that requires a future. But if you're calling an existing system that returns a future... It's going to be slow. The one thing you can do is you can use, um, you can use from future here. Th this is marginally beneficial. When you call into other code and you want to take its future and convert it to an effect, you can use the from future method. And you can, it gives you the execution context to run it on. So you feed that into your foreign code that you're calling out there that's you know, requiring, that's going to return you a future but requires an execution context. And that's beneficial. That way, Zio can manage where that future runs in a compositional fashion. Uh, question up there. Well, for, so the question was, if you have a code base that uses future in one part and Zio in another, it'll have both execution contexts. And the answer is that Zio does have built-in thread pools. So you don't have to configure anything out of the box. If you call, if you create a default runtime, for example, it builds a thread pool that's more efficient than the fork join thread pool used by the global execution context in Scala. Um, so it has all the built-in thread pools. They're all very well configured for modern application development, but you don't have to use them. So you can actually make Zio use the global execution context or any other execution context that's in your application. You don't actually need to create separate resources. You can let them share the same set of resources. That's very important because it's easy to create too many thread pools in modern applications because they're using all these different libraries and all these different libraries create their own thread pools. And, ends up being a, a huge source of overhead. Another question. Yeah. Yeah, so Zio has, first off, there's some problems with, with cats that percolate into cats IO that cause it to not be um, heap safe for doing certain operations. For example, if you use zip right or zip left, you actually leak heap space. And yeah, these are, these are problems. And um, possibly you were using those in your development of retry. But Zio has, first off, Zio can take tries and lift them up into Zio effects. It can take futures and lift them up into Zio effects. It can take either's, lift them up into Zio. It can take all these different data types that you have out there in Scala and lift them up into a Zio effects. And once you have a Zio effect, there's very powerful retry capabilities baked into Zio that are already stack safe and heap safe. And actually, we'll, we'll probably get a chance to look at that this afternoon after the, after the break. But let me give you a peek of what it looks like. You can take any effect and call repeat on it and provide it a schedule here. And these schedules 
compose in extraordinarily rich ways. So you can come up with any type of repetition schedule or retry schedule you want and compose it using a small number of operators. And then once you apply that using repeat or retry, in this case I'll do retry, so you retry that, you get back a new effect with the specified strategy applied to it. So this is a very powerful way of solving the entire class of repeat and retry problems. It's all type safe and it doesn't leak heap or stack space. All right, so let's take a quick look. We're, I think we're gonna take a break soon. D does anyone know what time the break is? It's three o'clock, okay. So we're gonna take a break in 15 minutes. But let's quickly look at, so obviously you can go to and from future and effect. Mostly you should always be thinking, I'm gonna go to ZO effect. Because you always wanna to go to the most powerful effect system in your application. Because if you go to weaker ones, then you lose capabilities. So ZO is the most powerful effect. You always wanna push everything into there so you can program at the level of the most powerful thing in your system. And so you, you wanna take futures and lift them up into ZOs, but you can also do that with try. So you can take tries and you can lift them up into ZO effects. So I, I recommend that in fact. Um, and then you can take options and you can also lift them up into ZO effects. What do you think the return type of this is? Let me use a string here. What do you think the return type of this is? I O unit nothing. Why do you think that is? That's exactly. Yeah, that's that's right. Because basically, there's an ice, there's an isomorphism between either unit and A and option of A. You can see this isomorphism because the none of this corresponds to a left of unit and the right of A corresponds to a sum of A. So you can go back and forth between these two representations without losing any information. So this leads to the encoding of option in ZO, which is as unit is the error type, because there's exactly one way it can fail, and that one way contains no information. And of course, if you have an IO of unit A, you can always map that unit into some error type that you want it to be. If you want to give it a name or give it a description or something, you just call map error to map that unit into something else. But that's, that's separated from the core operation of taking that option and lifting it up into a ZO effect. Uh, and then what you can also do is if you have an either value, you can take and you can turn that into an effect by calling ZO.from either on the either value. And then you just get back an IO. So in the case of try, what do you think you get back? Try can be either a failure with a throwable or a success with a value. So what do you think you get back from from try? Yeah, throwable for the error type. So you get back a task. For the option, you get back an IO of unit A. And for the either, you get back an IO of EA. You can take all these different, different failure modes in your app and unify them together at the same layer. So you can program in a uniform error type across your entire application. All right, so we have 10 more minutes. What we're gonna do is briefly cover uh, resource handling, because there's lots of other stuff I, I hope we can get to today. Resource handling. So this is a very common pattern in Java programming. Actually, let me make sure I don't have any critical questions. <laughs> Apparently we should be drinking. <clears throat> Okay, so try finally. This is how you use try finally in Java code. Often, it's a, it's a common pattern anyway. We, we don't need it as much anyway now that there's try with resources, but you still see this. And you see it in other languages that don't have try with resources. What is the point of try finally? Why did programming language authors give us try finally? Sure, sure. 
Yeah, to, to make sure that we don't leak resources. If we don't use try finally, if we, for example, in this code block, if we delete this code that I've highlighted and we just open the file and then we read the file and then we close the file, what goes wrong? Run out of handles. Yeah, you eventually run out of file handles because eventually that read file is going to die for some reason. And so um, it'll, it'll abort it, it'll unwind the stack, you won't close the file, and eventually you end up running out of file handles. And you have these inexplicable errors that no one knows. You, you know, user requests get longer and longer, latency increases and so forth, and finally someone or some monitoring system. Yeah, exactly. Can't, can't open a new connection. Things sort of kind of work, but not really, and then it just, it just goes downhill fast. So finally lets you guarantee that if you open something, then you close it. And that's a very important guarantee. If you want to build applications that don't leak resources, that you don't have to constantly restart for random reasons, and that users don't experience these weird errors, then you need to make sure that if you acquire a resource, you release it. And try finally can be used to do that in this very common pattern. So that's the good thing about try finally. The bad thing is it basically doesn't work with any modern code. Because in modern code, we acquire resources asynchronously. And some callback is going to call back into our system and say, hey, here's a resource. Once we start programming in the world of callbacks, try finally goes out the window. We can no longer use it. And that's why it's much harder to build async applications, modern applications that don't leak, because we have to do so much plumbing and sort of manual reasoning about all the possibilities that can go wrong in order to figure out how to safely release things. So Zio gives us a version of try finally that works in all cases. It has the same guarantees as try finally. Um, so, and those guarantees are precisely as follows. If the try block starts execution, then the finally block will also start execution. That is a very precise guarantee. And why is that so precise? Well, there's no guarantee that try ever starts. For example, if you never call this method, try will never start. Try has to start execution. Then the other guarantee is if try starts, then finally starts. It's not a guarantee that finally will finish because maybe it has a bug in it. Maybe it throws an error inside it. So the precise guarantee is of ensuring is if the try starts, the finally will start. That's true for both try finally and Zio's ensuring method. In exercise one, you're supposed to rewrite this program to use Zio. So you do that as follows. You do, um, well, you would, you would do something like this. Task uh, effect i plus one plus equal one. And then you would, right after that, you would do a task.fail with a new exception. Boom. And then you would have this task here, this compose task, and you would call ensuring, and you would specify a task dot effect total i minus equal one. Actually, this one could be total as well. Oops, sorry, effect total. All right, so this is the functional version of the preceding program. And it's using ensuring here to, you can think of this as installing a finalizer. Now you have the guarantee that if this effect starts executing, then whatever's in the ensuring block will also start executing. That's the exact same guarantee that try finally gives you. And that guarantee is not given by cats.io. So if you're using cats.io and you're using its version of ensuring, which is called guarantee, it doesn't actually guarantee it will be run. Question. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, what's going on here? We're mutating a variable here. We're mutating this variable here. 
And I'm, I'm doing this solely so you can observe the effect of this. This is not a very functional thing to do because we leak information on this mutable variable. Now, keep in mind, it's still functional. Why is it still functional? Because this no change to here is just a description of mutating a variable. It doesn't actually mutate a variable. It just describes the act of mutating it. So this is still a functional thing to do. But if we wanted to be proper programmers, proper FP programmers, then we would not use a var here. We would use a purely functional structure called ref, which is built into Zio. And ref is a model that allows us to model mutable references, but in a concurrent safe way. Vars are not concurrent safe. If you use an ordinary var here, you try to do this for multiple threads, they're gonna clobber each other with different instructions. You're not gonna be able to atomically increment this. And even worse, the, the different threads are gonna see different values for this because of caching. So you can solve all these problems or you can just say, no, we're not gonna deal with that mess. We're gonna use ref. Ref is purely functional var that you'll always see the latest value. You're not gonna see stale values and that you can atomically update. So it gives you all the benefits of a var, but in a purely functional package that doesn't have any race conditions, doesn't have any clobbering, doesn't have any stale cache issues. Uh, but yeah, you know, this, this mutating, this variable here, that's, that's not a very pretty thing to do. Even, even though it's still purely functional, we're creating a description of this, we're not actually doing it at this point in time. So if we were to factor this out, this would be our, our tripart. We could even say val try effect is equal to this. And then we could say val finalizer or finally is equal to this uh, last part here. And then we could say, okay, we're composing these two things together using ensuring by doing try effect ensuring finally effect. And there you have it, the same program recreated in several different ways. It is better. It is better. So the observation from the audience was that ensuring requires you give it a UIO. Ensuring requires that your finalizer not fail. So you're going to, if you use Zio, I guarantee you're gonna to run to the situation where you try to close a file inside a finalizer and you discover Zio won't let you do that because closing the file could fail. And it basically forces you to deal with that possibility inside your finalizer. So you could deal with that in one of many ways. Why is the reason why you can't allow a finalizer to fail, by the way? Right, so the finalizer fail, first off, it's unexpected. If you go into some code, you make some change, and then the finalizers run, the finalizers run implicitly on the way out. Whether or not things happen correctly, it's, it'll always be run. It's very unexpected if the finalizer ends up taking down your program, very unexpected. Even worse than that though, take a look at this bit of Java code, Java Scala code, actually it, it works in both languages. Uh, what is it doing? It's, it's doing a try catch block here, and then it's doing a try finally block here. And from this try, it's throwing E1, and from this finally, it's throwing E2. Here we have a major logical problem. We have a major logical problem here because try catch, the catch construct allows you to catch a single, expre a single exception by design. You can only catch one thing. You can't catch multiple errors at the same time. It doesn't make sense in exception models, it doesn't make sense. So here you have um, a situation where you're literally throwing two errors. This is not concurrent code, this will be executed sequentially, but because finalizers always have to be called, you run into a situation where the inner code throws something and then the finalizer that you have to execute on the way out of throwing that first thing, it also throws something. So two exceptions are being thrown from the same thread and then we're catching this right here, and if you execute this, you'll see finally puzzler doesn't throw, it doesn't throw anything. If you execute this, you're gonna get back unit. Question is, which exception did you catch? 
two, two things like we throw what we're trying to do regardless. So even if we didn't catch it, we still trying to do Oh, right. Yeah, because we get, this is typed as nothing. So these have typed nothing. Both of these have typed nothing. Right, but I, I just mean that it's not like we catch this exception and then one more gets thrown out of here. You know, we're done. We're, we've stopped the, the throws from propagating further up. That's what I meant by that. Um, okay, so which error gets printed out again? E2. Why, why is it E2? <laughs> Because of the last one? It's not a great reason. <laughs> That's not. <laughs> In production systems, if you have a primary failure and then you have a secondary failure, if your finalizer fails after something else fails, often that's a cascading failure. So in a production system, actually, I would say the more important error to, to report would be the primary failure. Because after that point, the state of this code is kind of undefined, and maybe the finalizer through just because of what what other error happened along the side. So unfortunately, you're right here though. Um, E2 will be printed. E2 is the thing that will be printed, even though it's a second. It could be a secondary failure, resulting from cascading failure failures. Um, and what happens to this one? <laughs> yeah, it's eaten. <laughs> So this is really interesting. I think that exception handling, which is baked into Scala and Java, is lossy. It loses errors. And often, it can report the wrong error. So it can both report the wrong error, and it can lose errors. Unfortunately, Zio will do neither. If you look at the cause of this, you'll actually see both failures. If you look at the cause, you'll see both failures, and you'll see them in sequence but also as just a, a way of discouraging you from writing code like this, ensuring takes a UIO, which means that you have to handle this. You have to handle failures in your finally block, basically. You have to handle them, make them self-contained so that they can't affect the linear flow of execution. Because it's not easy to reason about code that's throwing multiple exceptions even though it's linear code on a single thread. That's a weird situation that only arises because of the guarantees that finalizers have. And this helps reduce that from happening by forcing you to deal with finalizer's errors. All right, so it's 3 o'clock. We're going to take a break, and then we'll take a look at a higher level pattern built on ensuring called bracket that makes it very easy to deal with resources in a safe fashion.